next guy pay more money than I would be up to Blair Price. Mm -hmm. You can't do that on your own. You're not even going to sit when you know the rent is due, <laughs> and uh, you're going to sit and say, no, I won't do it for that money. You've got to pay me. I sat in my agent's office one time, and I knew that, <laughs> that the rent was due and a few things. And I, he was on the phone negotiating for me for a part. And he said, are you kidding? I, listen, I wouldn't even call Claude to give him this up. That's an insult. I said, I admired that. Uh, sounded like a, a pretty good deal. He said, they'll call back. In five minutes, about three minutes, the phone rang. And he said, okay, that's fine. We'll take that. Well, see, he knew. He knew how to play the game. I wouldn't know how to play the game. You know, as we were just preparing for this, we were talking about uh, you've done three television series. Uh, Sheriff Lobo, Nashville 99, and moving on, and you were just commenting about Nashville 99 being yanked, although it was doing well on the radio. Comment, this, please. This is an example, I think, of the magnificent stupidity of the networks, and why television is in such a sad state. We did many series, four episodes of a series in Nashville, Tennessee, in 1977, in the winter. We used the country music performers, uh, as Jerry Reed was my co-partner, uh, we used Charlie Pride as a straight detective. We used, in the four episodes, Tammy Wynette, Ray Stevens, Mel Tellis, and Chet Atkins. Johnny Paycheck was a heavy in one of the shows. And we had four wonderful shows. They aired the month of April, 1977, opposite Rockford Files, and we took the time slot four weeks in a row, and CBS did not pick us up as a series for the fall. And the the day. Day. <laughs> I, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Well, at that time, the AMA and the PTA were up in arms about violence on television. They've been a little quiet the last few years, and now is when we need them. But and the three networks for the fall season, among them, only picked up one cop show, if you could call it that, and that was Chips. And they turned down our show. They kept calling Ernie Frankel, our producer, saying, uh, give us another National 99. Ernie said, why don't you take the one I gave it? Hey, look, we never put anything back on that we took off. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, so Bob, you mentioned that they're going to be showing a film that was uh, really one of the bigger change of pace uh, from yeah. Planet of the Apes. I'm not sure what's the series. Tonight, right? But it's one of the, I think yeah. it was the last one. The and fifth you, one, Battle you know, for the Planet of the You were an ape maker, I which played, a lot of well-known actors did. I played General Aldo, head of the group. Okay, he was a villain, wasn't he? Yeah, oh, yeah. Was he? he killed Caesar's son, mm -hmm. and ape never kills ape. Right. And he gets thrown out of the village. He gets ostracized. Then later has a sword fight in the trees with Run Caesar, and, and then gets killed. And it took about three and a half hours to do the makeup, and approximately four seconds to get it on. <laughs> was that one of the more memorable roles? That you oh, it was wonderful. And the, the wonderful thing was. We would come in at 4.30 in the morning. Now, 4.30 in the morning, the only people in the freeways are drunks, cops, and a few apes, right? <laughs> We'd come in, and they had made molds of our faces, and they made two appliances, the top half and the bottom half. So we were each assigned our own makeup man, and mine would put it on, start with the seven pairs of hair things, glue right around the eyes, the whole thing, finish the top half. I would go eat breakfast come back, he took the chair, and I would take a nap, and he would put on the bottom of lunch and all that. And we found out the first day that you cannot chew lunch oh because the appliance comes to it. So my makeup man said, you will have a liquid lunch <laughs> from now on. So I would stick a straw in the side oh and have no shakes or fruit juice oh. or something like that. Claude, you've done a little bit of comedy from time to time. What sticks out in my mind is we're talking, I'm trying to remember some of the stuff you did. a love American style. Oh, the first kiss. <laughs> the kiss, the caveman. Oh, yes. And that was, that was something different. Oh, oh yeah. That, that was, and I did a wonderful thing, part in the great bank robbery. I played a villain. The premise of the story was a bank in this town whose depositors were all thieves. The Dalton brothers, the depositors, the James brothers, and I rob a train and I deposit. And I'm hanging around town to make sure my money's okay. And Clint Walker is an undercover Texas Ranger. Comes to town with some Chinese, starts tunneling to the bank. Zero Mostel, Jim Novak, Sam Jaffe are a fake religious group. Come to town, start tunneling to the bank. And I, I go into the, the laundry one time and Clint Walker's there. 
and I slap him because I wear black, black hat, black shirt, even my underwear. That's something black. I wouldn't want to try to do. He's very I know. <laughs> even my underwear is black, black, and I said he didn't starch my shorts. But it was a wonderful part. Yeah. It? Now, who are some of the well-known actors that you do bump into? I know Clint Walker's still around, Chuck Connors. And right. Uh, well, we're fading fast. You know, but I play a lot of charity golf tournaments. So I see Howland, and I see Ephraim Zimbalist. Uh, oh my, I see Alvy Moore. Alvy oh, came to sure. my tournament. Bob Donner, Charlie Lane, the old grouch, came to my tournament. John Larch is still around. Sure. Uh, I know we lost Neville Brand this year. Yes. Uh, Neville did Laredo. I know you did some guest yes. appearances on Laredo. He was really good. He was another actor who after playing so many evil villains, he yeah. was shooting Elvis Presley and his oh, right. He did Laredo, and he was so good in the comedic yeah. role as the, yeah. you know. Joe Carey from that is still around. Oh, sure. Uh, He's in a soap opera. Yeah, so. uh, that's right. And uh, uh, Peter Brown is still around. Oh, there. Jack Elam works. Jack Elam is still around working. Well, none of us are working as much as we used to because it's a whole different business. Claude, I'd like to know, naturally, I would think over the years with the good agent you had, you can be more selective about roles, not just with the salary, but with the role that you want to play. Nowadays, what type of a role would appeal to you if you got Well, to nowadays, you're not near as selective. You just kind of, but there are two rules of thumb. If the money is impressive, you take the part. If the part is impressive, you don't worry about the money, mm -hmm. and that's what you kind of try to maintain. Yeah. But there just isn't as much work as there was anymore. Sure. In fact, fortunately, I do the Amco commercials. Right. And they just signed me for three more years. Well, good. And so that's one. Yeah. I do voiceovers for safety shorts. A guy named Jesse Dunn makes five to eight minute safety films. And they satisfy OSHA's requirements for safety education and plans mm -hmm. and factory. And a lot of the guys here were talking about the they get, I narrate them, yeah. they get the safety films. Mm -hmm. So it's, after a while, it's it's sad that, that our business has dwindled. I feel very sorry for young actors starting out because there's so many places to work. Which is a question, another question here I was going to get to. If somebody comes up to you in the early 20s or late teens, they're really serious about the profession of acting. You can probably give them reasons for and not well, I would never, I'd never give them reasons against it because it doesn't make any, it, there's no sense. If somebody wants to do something, I, I wanted to be an actor and a lot of people told me it's, the odds are against it. I know all that, but I still tried and I was fortunate. I made it against the odds. But there was a dear friend of mine at Indiana University, a wonderful actor, just we worked in a couple of shows there, he wonderful radio. And I saw him, I used to see him whenever I was come to Louisville. And I saw him about oh, six or eight years ago. He was about ready to retire. And I said, Jack, come out and live with me and get into the business. He was an Orson Welles type, big with it. I said, try it. And he said, you know, the regret of my life is that I never tried it. And he died two years later, and he never tried it. So I think if you want to, you have to try it, and you may not make it. A lot of good friends of mine by the, have gone by the wayside, but I think you, it's better to have tried and failed than end up at age 60 or 65 and say, if only. You know, yeah. I think you have to. You have to go to New York or Hollywood. You have to get in little theater productions and polish your craft, sure. contact agents, try do you, to get... Do you believe that theater is the route of where it's at. Well, I think it's a good basic train, but then a lot of marvelous actors had their whole training in film, so. Mm -hmm. sure. But I think stage is very, stage is good for the discipline. Yeah. And I like to go back once in a while and do a stage play now, because on film, your concentration level has, you have to concentrate for maybe a minute, minute and a half. That's a long yeah. scene in film. On stage, you have to concentrate for every minute you on stage. Mm -hmm. So it's a good it's a good refresher, it's a good rediscipline in God's day. My final question to you, Claude, other than you know maybe making a good living and, and so forth, 
why are you proud to look back on your years as being an actor? Why can you say that, yes, I am an actor, I was an actor? What gives you the biggest satisfaction of saying that? I think I have worked with the most talented people in the world. And I'm not just talking about actors and actresses. If you want to do a period piece and you want a Louis XV chair, the prop department will make you a Louis XV chair that you can't tell from the original. If you want a man to fly through the air, the special and effects department will have that man fly through the air. If you want to hear some of the most beautiful music in the world, they will write that music as the background score for movie. And then you are privileged to work with Frederick Martin, Spencer Tracy, Humphrey Bogart, Fred McMurray, Jose Ferrer, Jack Collins. Yeah, and it just goes on and on, and you get to see legends in our business. All of these people are legends and their work will last forever. And I'm thrilled to think that my work will be right there in the too. Any regrets that you're more of a leading man type? Or? Not really, no. I, one regret maybe is that they do get some awful good parts and awful good scripts. Some of those I would like to have had. But if I had been the square job leading man, I probably wouldn't have gotten as much work as I did as an ugly habit. <laughs> Paul, what's next for you when you're done here in LaPorte in the Michigan State? Well, I'm going back home. I'm up for a couple of things. We're sweating out a couple of pictures, one picture and one television show. So now I just kind of take it as it comes and play golf in the meantime. All right. Claude Aikens, thank you so much for Thanks the time. And I'm sure you could write a book about me. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> that'll wrap up this edition of Interesting Individuals. Hope you enjoyed our program as much as I did. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. All right. How about a couple more?